I'll start the recording. Thank you, Tom. I started the recording to the cloud. Oh, okay, oh, great. great. And the next um, <coughs> meeting, so I don't forget it at the end or for people who leave early, will be the second Saturday of July. That's the pattern, the second Saturday at this time. It would be noon to one thirty, yeah, noon to one thirty Eastern time. So um, we'll be finishing up Ron's book on that date. So mark your calendars now. That's all I have. Terrific, thank you. And, and I, I want to thank Gail for um, you know if you've been I assume most of you, if not all of you, have been getting the very informative emails and keeping us posted and with the links to the book and the links to uh, David Orton's summary and all that. So. Thank you, Gail, for all the behind the scenes work that you're doing to, to keep this alive and make it go. Yes, exactly. So, um, okay. So what we're doing today is um, we're gonna be going over chapters five and six, uh, which in, in, in some ways is really kind of the, the crux of the book. And in chapter five, a, a, as you know, if you've read it or even glanced at it, is the uh, critique of world federal government and chapter six is the World Federalist response to that critique. So we thought we'd kick it off in, in a slightly different way uh, than we usually do. Now, chapter five, you know, as you've seen, has numerous critiques. So what David Orton and I are going to do, and David, you know, wrote the summary of the book, is um, we're going to do three uh, quick role plays. And the way we'll do it is I'm going to start off as the cynic or skeptic or critic. Um, and I, I will pick, uh, or I have picked one of the critiques and I'm going to give it as if in a debate or argument um, with David. And then David's going to respond a, a, as the world federalist. Then we'll have a kind of a little back and forth around that. Um, then we'll do a second one and then a third one. So it'll be kind of like a play in three acts, you know, three, three different critiques. Um, we'll be drawing on the critiques that Ron has in his book, uh, but at the same time, we'll try to update it with current world events and, and things of that sort to make it relevant to right now, as opposed to 1993 when the, the book was published. So we'll do that three times, like I said, and then we'll bring Ron in for any additional commentary, uh, suggestions, things we left out, additions, whatever. Um, so the, uh, the author himself will, 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 will have a chance to speak on that. And for that matter, critique uh, David and I uh, on what we did. And then we'll do a little bit of open discussion just around those three critiques, okay? Then after that, if anybody wants to play the skeptic, and we'll see how this goes. Um, if anyone wants to play the skeptic and introduce another critique, they can do that. And you know, if, if no one's interested, then we'll just move on to open discussion. But if anyone, let's say, has been puzzling over, you know, or, or, or you know, someone asked you this question and you couldn't answer and you want to actually role play it, you can play the skeptic and say, you know, what about blah, blah, blah. And the rest of us could come in with how we would answer and respond. So that'll be kind of the second round and we'll do that for a little while. And then we'll just um, open it to open discussion after that. And we'll kind of follow the energy. It's not, we're not gonna be on a time frame kind of thing for each of those segments. So our hope is, is two, twofold. One certainly is to get greater understanding of the issues and the debates and the arguments. But the other is really to empower you to better interact with people out there in the world. Uh, so rather than just, uh, you know, talk about it in an academic way, we'll see how these arguments live in actual argumentation and debate. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, have all of us get a better handle on how to dialogue around these things. So any questions just about the, the flow of, of the session, what we're planning to do? Okay, and like most of the things we do, this is an experiment. We'll see how it works and uh, we'll get a chance to um, check in at the end. And then a few minutes before um, you know, the end of the time, I'll make a few announcements and then turn it over to Gail to wrap it up. Um, so that, that's how we'll end up today. So, okay, so um, uh, Mr. World Federalist, are you ready? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, terrific. 
So if everyone else would mute their phones so we don't hear the screaming children and dogs and cats and all the other stuff in the background, and we'll go with it. So, okay. So um, critique number one. Okay. Um, uh, so, Professor, um, you know, in, in today's world, with the rise of nationalism, you know, populism and nativism, you know, and, you know, and we see this everywhere from Trump's anti-immigration policies to building walls to Brexit, you know, to the rise of the right wing and the neo-fascists, uh, you know, in, in Europe, um, China now flexing its muscles, uh, you know, in an effort to, to assert itself as a superpower and Russia trying to regain its superpower status, you know, even if World Federation were desirable, you know, it would seem that we've really missed our chance. I mean, the window has come and gone, you know, and the world is just, you know, the cent centrifugal forces are pulling it apart in every which direction. I mean, how can this, this dream, this fantasy that you guys have, you know, ever come to pass in today's world? Take that. <laughs> Well, the World Federalist would, response would be that uh, it's not a matter of choosing nationalism over federalism. Federalism, by definition, includes nationalism. So as World Federalists, we're not advocating for a one world government, even though that was an expression used for our movement for many years, but that's a misleading kind of expression. We're talking about a fourth layer of government above and beyond the national governments. So the feelings of nationalism and what's good for our nation and patriotism would con can continue even under a, a world federation. But the reason why we need a world federation according to World Federalist is because we have so many global problems that are not being solved under the um, current international system. So it's a matter of going from internationalism, which we currently have under the United Nations, to a global perspective in art to solve global problems. And that's why we need a democratic um, world federation in order to do that, because we're simply not gonna be able to do that uh, under our current system. We need to, first of all, as Ron points out in his book, uh, we need a system that will outlaw war because the war problem, of course, drains uh, tremendous amounts of money from each of the nations, from most of the nations at least, and uh, prevents us from solving many of our national problems. Uh, the war system and it's, uh, the tremendous amount of money that it involves also takes us away from solving global problems um, like climate change and pandemics and things that we're currently experiencing and not able to solve from a, a global level. So uh, that's why uh, we need a world federation and it needs to be democratic. And uh, we'll go through other ways later uh, that Ron talked about how to set it up and how it can be effective in solving global problems. Well, I mean, that all sounds well and good, but you, you, you seem to dance around a, a kind of uh, important issue, the one of sovereignty. I mean, certainly it would be great if we uh, could solve all those problems. I, I, you have no argument with me there, but don't we have to give up our sovereignty as nations? I mean, what if we wanna do you know, X, Y, or Z, um, and all of a sudden you know, some committee in Brussels says, sorry, Charlie, you, know, you, you can't do that as a nation. Uh, and that hurts our economy or, 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 or something else. I mean, what do, what do you have to say about that issue? Well, the, the prevalent notion of sovereignty uh, for many people is that nations do whatever they can get by with uh, based on what they perceive it to be their national interest. And that's part of the problem in not being able to solve our global problems. So I think the notion of sovereignty is misunderstood. Uh, it's not a matter so much of giving up sovereignty uh, because of the notion of federation uh, each nation would continue to be uh, sovereign in the sense of creating, uh, continuing to create its laws for people of its own nation. Uh, the idea of federation is that uh, above and beyond the national governments and their laws, though, would need to be a set of global laws that would apply to individuals and 
be able to do something about them, those who violate them. Um, so currently sovereignty is just used as an excuse for uh, continuing um, foreign policies, uh, which as you said, means we can just do what our uh, nations can do whatever they want to. Uh, but we're going to have to get beyond that in order to try and, and solve uh, global problems uh, through a federal kind of system. Okay, well, I, I see I'm not going to change your opinion on that point, so let me go to another. <laughs> okay, so, and, and that's the issue of diversity. That, you know, I mean, anyone who's traveled and even just watches the travel channel, you know, knows that the world has such enormous diversity whether it's in culture, language, religion, all kinds of practices, you know, their food, what they eat, you know, most countries, maybe all have a sense of national pride. Um, you know, how would we ever unite all of that under a single government, under a single flag? I just don't see it. Well, uh, it's another misperception uh, and uh, an assumption people make of trying to make everybody the same, trying to make all nations the same. And that's not the goal of a uh, world federalist. The world federalist response is that those kinds of national differences and those other differences of language and religion and culture uh, would continue uh, on under a world federation. And in fact, uh, that kind of diversity is what makes our world great. We wouldn't wanna make uh, everyone the same or everyone believing the same. But what we're, world federalists are advocating is that we have a common system um, by which we can um, uh, try and eliminate war and genocide and um, solve our global problems. Um, and people from different backgrounds can agree on what's good for the world. Um, the different religions of the world uh, can remain uh, but what has happened in the last century is that they've been able to meet each other and understand each other and see where they agree. So that's why the many religions of the world have agreed on the declaration of a global ethic and a charter for compassion. Uh, those, mean, those are common teachings in all religions. Uh, there are, um, even though there are different languages uh, you know, everyone, I think, knows that Ron is advocating Esperanto as a uh, common secondary language in addition to native languages that would help everyone communicate with each other directly. So that doesn't eliminate the differences of languages. It simply adds on a common language for everyone. Um, and people are both similar and different. Uh, as people travel around the world, we see uh, where we, what we have in common. We all have common hopes and dreams and needs. Uh, that's the, basically the same, no matter where you, which country you're in. Uh, but of course, there are differences too. So World Federation would not try to make everybody the same or make everything the same. Um, national governments could continue to have different kinds of economic systems, uh, even different political kinds of systems. But what they can agree on is a common system that would unite them together in order to solve global problems and to eliminate the, the problem of war. Uh, so, something tells me you've thought about these things before. Well, I've read Ron <laughs> Glossop's book. Okay. Many, well, many years ago. Okay. Hey. Well, let me, let, me, let me tell you what really bothers me about all this World Federation stuff. Um, you know, uh, the, the British historian, Lord, Lord Acton, famously said, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Now, if, if there is a, a corrupt government and, and a, you, know, a, a, you know, a power grabbing government, whether it's the US or any country, if I live there, you know, I could leave. You know, I could even apply for political asylum if things get so bad to another country. But if, if the power is concentrated at the global level, and, you know, I mean, right now we see a system where the Chinese are working out this, this quote unquote, social credits. So through face recognition, they can tell where everyone's going. Uh, they've got the supercomputers now to track everyone. They could add, you know, uh, points to someone so they get higher in the political thing. They get better food rations. I mean, God only knows 
and you know within a few more years you know you know showing what uh you know i forgot the fellow's name the the, the whistleblower who ended up moving to russia i'm forgetting his name right now um but uh you know we we we're, we're just at the at about the point where we could perfect the tracking of everyone you know and, and really having a, a a kind of a total a totalistic tyrannical form and i i'm just terrified to see that power in the hands of of just a few people so how do you prevent this thing from becoming a global tyranny i mean it seems like all of the you know or if not m most of, of the um you know, big systems turn tyrannical. I mean, even look at the church or whatever. You get, you know, all of these, you know, either, you know, religions or countries or whatever, and they start off very visionary, no question about it, and may survive for a while like that. But after a while, it just goes, you know, goes sideways, and, and you've got all this corruption and what have you. Um, you know, this could be, go the same route, could start off very visionary and the world's best minds working on it, but what about 20, 30, 50 years down the road when it starts going off the rails? I mean, how do you prevent something like that? First of all, uh, Lord Acton's saying, uh, which you mentioned at the beginning, uh, was actually a reference to the papacy. And so the problem is if power is concentrated in just one person or in a small group of people, uh, that uh, can lead to a kind of dictatorship. The way you prevent a World Federation from becoming a dictatorship uh, is by making sure that it's democratic, it's constitutional, and it's based on the principle of subsidiarity. So let's go through each of those three things. Uh, the current United Nations we know is not democratic uh, because in the General Assembly, every nation gets one vote regardless of its population. and. Um, in Ron's book, he mentions uh, Richard Hudson's binding triad proposal to try and make the UN General Assembly uh, more democratic. Many of you know since Ron's book that Joe Schwartzberg has written his book on weighted voting in the United Nations to make it more democratic. So by having um, a true democracy based on principles of um, uh, equality, um, contrary to the current United Nations General Assembly, then I think that would prevent a lot of um, um, problems in, in any one group having any uh, more power. Um, in the Security Council, we know that five nations of the world, the permanent members, have a permanent veto. So under a World Federation, that wouldn't exist. Um, so currently, you can say five nations rule the world in, in one sense by having a veto in the Security Council. So under a World Federation, that wouldn't be the case. So a World Federation would have to be democratic uh, in order to uh, um, be something that uh, reflects uh, world consciousness and uh, uh, the attempt of the world to solve our global problems. Then uh, the other thing that's uh, extremely important is a world constitution that would spell out in great detail the powers and limitations of each uh, aspect of a World Federation uh, and also the relationship between the World Federation and the national governments. Uh, so a world constitution would have to have a bill of rights for national governments and it would also have to uh, have a bill of rights for all world citizens. Um, the other thing, a World Federation wouldn't uh, concentrate uh, executive power in, one, in just one person, uh, unlike our uh, US National Federation that has a presidency. Um, Ron talks about a uh, committee of executives uh, that could uh, make sure that laws passed by a world parliament would be uh, um, enacted and uh, that uh, courts then could prosecute individuals who violate those uh, world laws. Thirdly, the principle of subsidiarity is so important. Um, a world federalist does not believe that a world federation can solve all the problems of the world. Uh, national governments have to continue to solve problems within their own national borders, just and local governments have to uh, solve local problems. 
but the purpose of a world federation would be to solve global problems that national governments cannot currently solve. So if you have a world constitution, the principle of subsidiarity, the division of powers, um, and uh, everything explicit in a constitution, then the concerns that uh, you had mentioned, I don't think would come up. Um, I think the constitution uh, for the world would have to be very explicit though on what issues uh, would be dealt with by a world federation, and which ones would be left to national governments. We know in our own country, uh, two main problems, of course, that divide our country uh, is the question of abortion and the question of gun rights. Um, so I think those two issues should uh, specifically be mentioned in a world constitution as things that national governments would deal with and that uh, a world federal government would not deal with. Um, we also have in this country the problem of income inequality and uh, racial injustices. Um, those are things though that also exist in other countries. Uh, so maybe a world federation could deal with those kinds of problems that deal in, that many countries uh, exist uh, have. But um, a world constitution, I think, is going to be have to be very explicit on which issues and uh, which problems uh, a world federation can deal with, and which ones are left to national governments to deal with. Great. Well, for, from one professor to another, I would have to say if this was your doctoral dissertation defense, you pass. So, <laughs> so, so thank you. Thank you. So I, I want to, yes, yes, okay, a round of applause for anyone who feels so inclined. <laughs> okay, so I'd, I'd like to at this point uh, throw it open to Ron uh, for any comments, additions, or, or whatever. So take it away, Ron. Well, first of all, I want to thank both you and Dave for doing a tremendous job of introducing the issues and pointing out the argumentation back and forth. I think it's important for everybody to recognize that my interest in the whole issue of world federalism came about when I was a high school debater. And that was the debate topic in all the high schools of the United States in 1946 and 47, that the UN should be transformed into a world federation. And of course, the big model that most people had in mind in this country is what happened in the United States when we went from the Articles of Confederation to the United States of America, which was really an amazing development. In fact, when you go back and look at it, you wonder how on earth did they ever pull it off? Uh, Alexander Hamilton was the main guy, George Washington, James Madison, Many others played a big role. They had a lot of opposition. You talk about national loyalties now. In the United States, there were state loyalties. And in fact, George Washington had a very difficult problem during the Civil War when the soldiers in New Jersey said, why should we pay any attention to you? All The only reason that you have any command at authority at all is because of this Continental Congress and we don't understand why they have so much authority. So our allegiance is to, the, to our state government, to New Jersey, to Pennsylvania, to Rhode Island. And so there was a big, big obstacle to overcome with regard to the loyalties to the state governments. One of the critical things that was very helpful to the United States was the common language, the common English language, and the common British background. That certainly was important. But that's exactly why we also need to look at Switzerland, because Switzerland is another example of a confederation that had many wars between the different cantons, as they're called, 
until they finally decided to adopt a federation. They went from a confederation to a federation with the same kind of success. It put an end to wars that they had had for decades. And they didn't even have, <coughs> they didn't have the advantage of a common language. <coughs> so in some ways, also Switzerland already has the idea of a collective administrator instead of just one person in charge of, in charge of everything. <coughs> so we need to look at Switzerland also as an example of how one can move from a confederation to a federation. I think Dave made a very good point near the end. Governments have power. There's no doubt about it. And so we do need to worry about this problem of a dictatorship of the world. But we also know how to deal with that. As Dave pointed out, constitution restrictions are critical. Also, the idea of just having a group of administrators instead of one person. There's no reason you couldn't have a five person administrative council where new, one new member was elected every five years. And so you would rotate the person that had been there for already for four years would be the chair, but then it would rotate among the other members so, so that nobody would have all the authority. So I think it's very critical to see one of the reasons that I wrote the book the way I did, I think that in order to make sure we don't make mistakes as a federation, is to look at the arguments against the federation and take a cognizance of them. Think about, okay, that is a real problem. Then let's figure out what do we do with it. How about the problem of language? What do we do with that? Uh, how do we resolve the problem of different languages? We, when we talk about the diversity in the world, the, the diversity of religion, of different uh, customs with regard to food, uh, different customs with regard to how we dress, the critical one is language. And here is where my experience with Esperanto has been very helpful to me. I have been to China five times. I don't speak Chinese. How can I do it? It's because of Esperanto. I have Esperanto friends in China. So that when I went to China, I just communicated with them ahead of time. I'm still communicating with some of them. I, I also have friends in Brazil. I don't speak Portuguese. How is this possible? Esperanto makes it possible to connect with other people. And then the other differences, what do you eat? What do you wear? What do you think about ideology? They can be dealt with if you have a way of communicating with the other people. That's why language is so critical. Now we have something that earlier ages did not have. We have computers and international communication. That has changed things. So, you know, one of the things that is most difficult for people to catch is how different time, what, how important time can be. In, in our own human experience, ideas about space with geometry and so on came a long time before ideas about time. The notion of history came up only later. So we need to recognize the importance of cha change that takes place over time. Gradual change is much better than rapid change. In fact, one of the problems that we're having in the world right now is the rate of change has been so rapid it's very difficult for people to adjust to rapid change. If we can slow things down a bit, that is very helpful. Now, there are some people that don't want things slowed down, and they are the ones that are a problem. Very often, 
There are people who want change immediately. They want revolution. And that is what generates violence. So I do want to thank both Bob and Dave for their very good introduction to this subject. I don't think I have a lot of lot more to say at the moment. I guess in terms of what I just said, though, I want to repeat what's really important for nationalism and diversity is language. Identity and language are very closely tied to each other. From one point of view, your native language is absolutely critical to who you are. Now, some people do go on and learn other languages, even become very, very proficient in using other languages. And that does help very much in terms of getting along with other people. But we do need a common language for everybody that's not a national language. Because as soon as it's a national language, that gives unfair advantages to the people using that language. I, I foresee in the future, right now, I see we're, we're getting into a world where English has a great dominance, even greater dominance than French had at the end of World War I. But how did it, the, the League of Nations, the first resolution in the Assembly of the League of Nations was an, a resolution that all the children of the world should be taught Esperanto. How did that end up not being adopted? Well, in the League of Nations, it was a confederation. Everything had to be unanimous. If even one country did not like it, then it could not go ahead. And what was the one country that stopped it? France, and the grounds that we don't need Esperanto, we already have a world language, namely French. Now, the introduction of that resolution about um, about Esperanto was from South Africa, and it was partly, maybe, an effort to keep French <laughs> from having domination over English. But I think that now we've got the same problem with English as what people saying, well, why can't just everybody speak English? Well, that's nice if you're an English speaking person, but what if your native language is Spanish? or Portuguese, like in Brazil or in China. I mean, people do not, and, and one of the things that we'll see in the Esperanto class, those of you who are taking Esperanto, how, this, how difficult Esperanto can be for English speaking people, not because of Esperanto, but because of English. <laughs> so yeah, how can you have an, a language where you've got the same word to, that it's spelled T-W-O or T-O or T-O-O, -O, and it's got three different meanings. I mean, Esperanto is unique in combining the uh, oral language and the written language in a way that doesn't ha does not happen with national languages where the, the oral form came way before the written form. I see Donna's hand up and I'm going to open the floor to everybody. Um, but I, I have one or two quick things I want to say. So Ron, are, are you complete? Yes. Great. Th thank you so much. Well, thank so you. Before I open the floor to focus, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, just a, a couple of quick things. One is to let people know if you're not familiar with the chat feature, because there is a conversation going on minimal, but in chat. You can bring your, if you have a computer, I'm not sure where it is if you're using an iPad or a phone, but if, you have a, if you're using a computer and you bring your cursor down uh, to the bottom below all the images, uh, the, there, there'll be a bar that should light up unless it's already lit with several buttons and one of them says chat. So if you push that button, a chat box should open up and you'll see some people are talking with each other uh, please don't send me chats. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to not monitor that and focus on the facilitation. Um, so anyway, so just, just to, to let you know that that's there. Um, uh, second thing I want to mention, uh, just off of Ron saying the way he got involved with this whole movement out of the you know, high school debating, um, we are now looking into, they still do that. They still have those national debates. So we are now 
researching, there are apparently two national organizations that, that hold them. So we are now <clears throat> seeing if we could reintroduce so many years later, uh, World Federation as being the new national debate. And maybe we'll have a whole incoming crop of Ron Glossops uh, yes. in the next generation. So, um, so that's that would happening. Be a real challenge, however. You've got to have some issue that has a lot of popular attention. Right. right. 46, 47, that was the case. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, that, that is very true. Um, th third thing is, is Gail reminded me the name I was groping for was Edward Snowden. Uh, so that's, uh, that, that is the person. Thank you, Gail. And the last thing, just to speak to the language issue, um, we may actually have a kind of a surprising fix right now. Um, you can now, some of you may know this, some of you may not, that you can now get an app on your iPhone where you talk and it translates it into the other language almost simultaneously. Um, so we actually may have a workaround uh, on that, which is not to say that people still can't learn Esperanto, uh, but we actually may have a, fi a technological fix to that. So having said that, um, I, I will take a cue. I will, um, oh, so for those who are, are new, uh, what we do is we stop and people raise their hands and I, I start a list. So we have some order to it. Uh, Anisha put her name already in the chat box a few minutes ago. I saw Donna next. So I'm gonna take a cue for, um, for just focused on the three different scenarios that David and I role played and anything that Ron added afterward. So if we could stay focused on that right now, again, the three scenarios were nationalism, how could we do this when it's every nation for themselves, the diversity, how can we do it with such a diverse world, and the global tyranny issue. So those were the three, and, uh, and anything that Ron said on top of that. So any issues around that, um, I'll, as I said, I'll take a cue. So any, anyone else beyond Anisha and Donna, uh, please raise your hand. If you're on the phone, call your name out. I see author, any, anyone else? Okay, Gail, anyone else? Okay, good, let's start with Anisha. If, if you'd unmute yourself when you're coming on and remute when you're done, take it away. Thank you, Mr. Bob. Can everyone hear me clearly? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so what I want to say about diversity is that uh, some traditional rigid-minded people will always be there to object the you know, globalization. That's not a problem. We can overcome that. But the real problem is nationalism or sovereign power. When countries will retain their sovereign power, then they can easily um, show their thumb to uh, world government that we are not going to listen to you. I'm absolutely agreeing with Mr. David. And for this reason, League of Nations failed. We need a Security Council, may not be restricted to P5, but we need it. And uh, about the civil war, um, if every country went on to civil war, then the world government will be in real trouble. One another thing I want to point out about language, that yes, I agree that iPhone, there is an app which can translate easily, but I highly doubt the accuracy. And secondly, there are many people in this world who cannot buy one iPhone. For example, India. Many people in Africa, India, live uh, on uh, less than 100 rupees or uh, $1 in a day. They cannot buy it. So that's the problem. And the last issue is um, this can lead not present of Security Council can lead to another world war. For example, Africa. We have one Security Council. Humanitarian law says that um, humanitarian laws will apply there where people are living at war-like situation. Armed attackers are attacking daily. They cannot sleep because they are hearing the gunshot sound and 
as there are no gunshots going outside their home, armed attackers are attacking them, burning their crops and houses. So they are in a warlike situation. United Nations Security Council is silent. The government of Af Africa is failing. So what's the ultimate result of it? UNHG is uh, saying about ceasefire, but these non-ceasefire is resulting social insecurity, political insecurity, and that is bringing environmental insecurity. Those who don't have a house, they cannot think about to build up a good uh, washroom or treatment of water or building solar panels and renewable energy and so on. So these are the problems. This can lead onto a third world war. That's all. Thank you. And, 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 um, and I, I, I realized as you were speaking that I, I wanted to mention one other ground rule that we work on is that when you have the floor, if you can keep it within about two minutes, and I'll let you know when, when the time is up. Um, so for the, the, yeah, so, so yeah, so at the maximum people can get in. So thank, thank you, Anisha. You. And moving on to Donna. Um, first, I, I want to say to Anisha that we're not, I, I, I'm not, I don't, I, we're not against the Security Council. We're against the veto in the Security Council. And many of us support what's in Joe Schwartzberg's book about regional representation so that every person in the world is represented at the Security Council. So uh, I, it's not that we want to eliminate the Security Council, um, but we want it to become democratic. Um, and um, actually, the comment I wanted to make was about sovereignty, that the one thing I would have wanted to add to what Dave had said is that I think, I think what's wrong in the world is that people think that sovereignty belongs to nations, and it doesn't. Sovereignty belongs to the people. And the people have agreed to give in our, our sovereignty to our nations, and it's time for the people to say this isn't working. And we want some of our sovereignty now to flow to the, a, a federal um, government that would enable um, the world to work better. So anyway, that's what I wanted to, one thing I would have added about sovereignty. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Donna. Arthur, you're up next. Okay. You gotta um, go off mute. Yeah, okay. I think I just unmuted there. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I love that you invite us to engage in a role play. I think it's good to make this fun. Are we, are we going to, can I do a, a back and forth role play or are you going on to other kind of comments? Yes. Yes. That is the next, the next part. This is the just comments part. on the first. We're finishing okay. the first, so the first the next round. Part then. I want to, I want to engage in that uh, role play. Okay, great. Yeah. So you'll be first up in the second round. We're okay. wrapping up Thank the, you. we're wrapping up the first round. Thank okay, you. Gail. First, I'd like to comment on, I think that Ron did an extraordinary job of presenting the counter arguments, especially. Um, it's easy enough to present arguments you believe, but <laughs> presenting arguments you disagree with is a lot harder. And um, perhaps because he originally um, learned about World Federation in a debate format where you need to know what the other side is, so to speak, um, he was very familiar with that. But I think he did an extraordinary job of presenting it as I think people who would, would pose those arguments would pose them rather than in a biased kind of way. And I, I, you know, that's pretty difficult to do. So I want to give him a lot of credit for that. Um, regarding the corruption issue, I see kind of sub-level, I know, levels of that. One is um, coming up with a, um, a structure to begin with that would help to prevent the rise of tyranny and, and um, help to prevent um, corruption. And there we have, you know, various ideas. Joe Schwartzberg's is perhaps the most detailed. Um, but then there's also implementing that in the process of establishing a World Federation. There's likely to be a lot of trade-offs and maybe some things would be implemented and other things not. 
and what we would come up with might not be, I mean, there might be loopholes in it that undermine the whole thing in the way that it's actually established. And then the third part of that is even if we do get something that would seem to be workable, you know, really work um, as best as it could, um, the next part of it is to prevent the subversion of that. So for example, the US with the checks and balances, I mean, that's brilliant, but those checks and balances have been undermined. And so at present, we really don't have the checks and balances working in the way they're supposed to. And the US system has been corrupted. So uh, there's a Princeton study saying that the US is not a democracy. It's an oligarchy at this point. So anyway, I just wanted to draw attention to kind of different levels of, of problems or issues. Great, thank you, Gail. And you're right, right on, the, on time. Okay, I was gonna take a second cue. I see, and, and is it Barat or Barat? Or how, how do you, Barat, okay. Barat. And, okay, and uh, anyone else? Okay, got Tom Hastings. Okay, anyone else? Father Ben, anyone else in the queue? Okay, take it away, Bart. Well, I'm a little conflicted about this one language uh, argument. Uh, I like the idea. In fact, I'm trying to learn uh, Esperanto. <laughs> and thanks, Ron, for uh, getting us to do that. But, you know, I also think about coming from India, I'm aware of so much amazing literature that has happened in so many regional languages. And remarkably, as more and more people kind of focus on, say, English or Hindi or Tamil or some of the, these Indian languages, uh, there's less and less kind of knowledge among the people of all that rich heritage that's been out there. And I'm thinking about the indigenous peoples all over the world how much of the treasure and knowledge they have is just being lost continually. Just as we are losing species, we are also losing the indigenous knowledge. And uh, so to that extent, I think this idea of diversity that we talk about is much, much, much more diverse than just the sort of sociological uh, diversity that normally one discusses about, you know, races and so on. And so I'd like to see some way of, uh, uh, and also the other point about the Esperanto, which I'm happy to learn, is uh, remember the letters of the alphabet or the characters, say, in Chinese and those languages or Indian languages have nothing in common with the characters of Esperanto. So Esperanto is completely foreign, just like other foreign languages to majority of people of the world. Maybe not majority, but pretty close to, you know, 40% of the people of the world. So that's, that's my dilemma, uh, help. Okay. Thank you, and uh, right on the time, okay. Tom Hastings. Here we go. Yes. I was struck by, uh, I think it was Gail who said that the checks and balances that we have in the United States have been eroded. And it occurred to me, we should try to do the same thing that Ron did with uh, uh, the objections to World Federation. We should be looking at the checks and balances and where they're failing and what are the, what are, what would be solutions to make them work better. And I was wondering, whether, is anybody working on that in, that you've heard, heard it in, in a university or anywhere uh, <clears throat> to try to see that by the time we write a world constitution, we will have had a chance to fix the things we've learned over the last 200 years with our checks and balances and get, and get it, fix it in the world constitution. Great, thank you, Ron. So I'm sorry, so Tom. So let me invite anyone who has an answer or a response to that to get in the queue after Father Ben, who is next. So okay. Father Ben.
You're on mute still. You're still on mute. You are still on mute. Yeah, we do not yet hear you. Lower you, now. Okay. You got good, it. good. I, you got I, it. I think the uh, dialogue that we heard in the in Ron's book is dealing uh, mostly with government <clears throat> and and with law, and that's extremely important. Uh, but I think when we uh, talk about world order, that uh, a picture of world order that we want, there are aspects that we need to include, like uh, education. Uh, what, what kind of education do we want? What kind of emphasis on nonviolence? Uh, is there, are there ways to better listen to other people? Uh, are there ways to better communicate uh, the techniques of communication? Uh, is uh, religion uh, something that can be helpful as well as uh, a problem? So I'm just saying that uh, the total picture uh, of the kind of world that we want would, <clears throat> would include more than government and law, as important as that is. Okay, thank you. Uh, anybody else want to get in the queue about, again, just, just first round, those three issues and uh, what Ron said? Donna, you're on mute. Go right ahead. I, so I was going to give my answers to Tom Hastings. Is that Terrific. part of what's going on right now? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. sure. Okay. Um, I think I think we all know what's wrong. Nobody's got to study it. We've been seeing it coming. First of all, there's the racism, which is which is an underlying problem, and and we got to deal with it. And it affects our democracy. It affects everything. It affects our morals and our morality. And another is um, voter voter voting issues, like removing people from being able to vote. I mean. The U.S. does a terrible job. We need to call in the, the people who monitor international elections so they can come and watch us screw up. Um, the fact that we call company people, that's like baloney. I'd use a stronger word, but I don't want to offend the men in the room. <laughs> um, and um, uh, allowing money to rule elections, too much money spent on elections. Dick Cheney getting that law passed that says you don't news agencies don't have to be truthful. I mean, we, you know, I, I think I think we know a lot of us just know what's wrong. We've seen it. We got to make sure all those issues are dealt with. There might be more not to say, but there's just so much we already know. Drives me crazy. Thank you. Great, great point Tom, that we need to make sure we incorporate those in our Constitution. Thank you. I'll put myself in the queue. Um, is there anybody else who wants to be on? And then we'll wrap up and go to the second round. Uh, Ron, um, why don't you go first and then I'll say what I'm saying and then we'll move on to the second round. Oh, Prosper. Okay, then Prosper. And thank you, Melanie, for pointing down to Prosper's box. <laughs> okay, uh, take it, Ron, then Prosper. I'd like to say a word for philosophy. Many of you know that that is my career. I've been a professor of philosophy as well as peace studies. What does philosophy mean? It means you open up your mind to all different kinds of ideas. Everything is open to inquiry, to question. It means that you need to get used to the idea of listening to ideas that you don't agree with. So philosophy is kind of the root of my outlook of let's make it open to everyone. With regard to language, on Esperanto, Esperantos do not say we just want one language and everybody has to use Esperanto. Esperanto in addition to the other languages. And in fact, Esperanto becomes a way of preserving the minor languages against the major languages. Right now, 
Esperanto is not wiping out any language. What's wiping out languages, the minor languages, are the major languages. The major languages are the problem. And what's uh, the problem with a dictatorial or one uh, one dimensional outlook, this is the only way. You got to use my language or not. You got to think my way or that's out. That's exactly what philosophy is against. It's not just one answer to everything. It's a matter of opening your mind to all the possibilities. So that's what I'm hoping that this whole exercise demonstrates the value of that kind of open discussion of different ideas. It's the Great. basis Thank you. of democracy. Thank you, Ron. Bob, so, so, Bob, so, so, I just yes. want to say, um, so Veda yes, Maani Ewing it, also has her it. hand up. Okay. Yes, yeah, I, I was just going to say that. So I'll take Prosper, so Veda, then I'll, I'll come in, say my piece, and then we'll move to the uh, additional role plays. So uh, Prosper, go ahead. You're on mute. Okay. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, well, on the question of... Uh, sovereignty and yeah i just wanted to say how much i commend that the, i commend the work that you're doing that we're doing because it used to be my hope that the u.s would lead the way the gov the u.s government would lead the way the same way it did after world war ii with eu and making sure that france and germany were not clashing but now it does look like it's gonna the whole burden is gonna you know really of, it falls, the responsibility falls on the citizens. So uh, I'm hoping that, especially with the younger people, I think they understand these ideals. And I think we really need to popularize them, uh, which, which is why I think the, the idea of the debate is really important. Anyway, I'll just look forward to learning more. Well, the, you, you do what we do so that we can get more younger folks to, to join in this movement uh, because our government seems to seem to care about strategic interests over the promotion of the well-being of everyone. Um, and uh, their interests and those of their citizens that usually don't align, which, which is a problem. So on the idea of uh, our sovereignty, from my experience in, in Africa or even here in the US, it seems to be the card that every leader plays when they want to oppress their own people. But it's never really about the interests of everyone. Um, so, so I think that, the, yeah, really like the citizens of the world and the US citizens really, as US citizens, we have even a bigger responsibility to carry out that uh, mission of really, uh, you know, advancing towards the World Federation. Thank you. Thank you, Prosper. And first, I want to apologize to uh, Soveda for not oh. seeing the mechanically raised hand. Uh, no. <laughs> I was just tracking for human hands. Right. Uh, but right. I, I, so thank you. And uh, go, go ahead. You've got your time. Uh, thank you. So a couple of short points. First, let me loop to what uh, Prosper said about sovereignty. Right. And do you um, want to come on I camera? Think... You're not on camera. I, wanna... I, it says I'm on camera. I don't understand. I should be on camera. I've stopped my video. Oh, so okay. I apologize. Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on here. Okay. Well, we hear you fine. Yeah. Um, so so the, first, uh, the first point has to do with sovereignty. You know, this, this I, I, while building institutions of global governance is absolutely critical, they have to be built on a foundation of a, a shared system of global ethics. Um, and those ethics need to be woven into the essence of the institutions. And the, the ethic that I would propose is missing here is this real deep understanding on the part of our leaders and citizens of the oneness of humanity that we are truly all one as our nations. Once we grasp this, in other words, it translates into the advantage of the individual nation can only be guaranteed by guaranteeing the advantage of the interconnected whole, in other words, humanity. Once we understand that, and once we can get our leaders to understand that better, once we get smart enough to elect the leaders that are fit to serve us, in other words, leaders who understand this principle, then the rest follows with, with nations being willing to cede a small modicum of sovereignty to this global institution. 
um, in order to tackle challenges that can only be tackled through global consultation and global decision making. That was the first point. The second quick point, which was my original one, is that in response to the first big question that you role played with David, you know, I think I would step back and add context. If we look at the arc of human history, if we consider that human society has been evolving through various stages of development, we can understand that the next necessary and inevitable step in our evolution as we have uh, become increasingly integrated with widening um, circles of integration, the next inevitable step is to owe our primary loyalty to the human race and to the globe as a whole. Once we understand that these questions of, oh, haven't we missed the boat and all of this cease to come into play because we understand that the period that we're collectively going through right now is a period of turbulent adolescence. And it is in the nature of adolescence to act out, to constrain, to push the envelope, and to try to escape the inevitable responsibilities of adulthood. So the rising nationalism, the polarization, all of these are really, to me, indicia of these final death throes of a turbulent adolescence, with the next step being this evolution to a new system, new way of being, new mindsets, new habits, and new systems of global governance that meet the needs of our age of maturity. So that's all I wanted to say. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, and I'll just say a few things to, to tie together a couple of threads. And then looking at the time, we may only have time for one role play. So we'll let authors start with that. So first to Tom, who raised the issue about looking at our own country, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I will say there, there are now actually a number of good books and one documentary. Uh, I'd have to think of the names of all that, that trace to how we got here from there. Uh, I know that this particular documentary starts with Newt Gingrich and going through his planning and all and how the, the power struggles and things in the U.S., you know, how things got to be so divided. So there's one narrative out there. Others go back uh, to the court case of, I think it was the uh, Southern Pacific Railroad versus Santa Clara, which was the first corporate personhood law. Uh, I think it was in the 1800s. And then all the law that built, it's built out from there, a fellow by the name of Hart, Tom Hartman, a progressive commentator, has done a lot of work on that. And there have been a couple of books written on that. So if you want to know how things got to be the way they are and so divided, other people have looked at Reagan's deregulation uh, of the media, uh, the, I think it was the fairness doctrine that stopped being enforced, that forced, uh, if you're going to have airtime, you have to present balanced views. And then after that, cable TV coming on, the splintering, you know, of all the media so people can just listen to what they're interested in and don't have to hear other sides, et cetera, et cetera. So there, there are a lot of good narratives out there now as to how it got to be as bad as it is. So just, just to, to say that, you can hunt those down. Number two to Father Ben saying that it's, um, that we have to look just beyond government to things like education, et cetera, et cetera. That, that, let me say, yes, and, and, and the issue is that once the government is in place and can come up with world legislation, that all of those other things, education, uh, the environment, you know, all of the human rights, et cetera, all of those other things can then be dealt with. The idea is first putting together the problem-solving body that could, and the, the, the legislative body that could get the, get the ball rolling, essentially, and as, as you may know, um, within World Federation, there's a broad spectrum of folks who you might call the minimalists at one end that are saying it should just be set up to prevent war, period. That's it. Anything else is overreaching. To the other extreme, if you remember Juncker's book, I don't, I don't like the title he gave it, but he called it the omnipotent world state, where at the global level, um, they're involved with everything. You know, so there's a Department of Education, a Department, you know, an Environmental Protection Agency, that everything exists on the global level as it would in a country. So, and there's a whole spectrum in between. So, um, but in order to get whatever ball rolling you need to get, um, you know, the advocates of world federalism say the World Federation is what you've got to get in place. And the last thing to Ron saying that kind of philosophy 
is the place to stand on to look at all, all, all other things that, again, as you know, you know, every group, whether it's, um, you know, the Marxist view of capitalism or the religions or whatever, part of the struggle of all this is everyone is looking for where is the primary place where you stand, where, where then you can analyze and assess everything else. And there's no agreement on that. You know, people would say, well, philosophy, if you're going to have that as the primary thing, you know, a religious, you know, partic particularly religious people might say, that opens you up to considering the thoughts of Satan. You know, we don't want that. There are certain things, even in Buddhism, which, which I, I'm more steeped in, there, there, there are things that we're told not to think. I mean, not in that way, but to avoid the unwholesome and to move toward the wholesome and actually train the mind to not have certain thoughts arise, you know, rather than consider them, you know. So, the, the, so it really, where is the, the, the prime foundation upon which you stand? Of course, the existentialists say there is none, you know, and, and, but of course, that's their prime foundation. Um, and that's the, the reason for existential angst, that there is no place to stand from which to look upon all else and make definitive judgments and assessments, which is why it's so much fun being human. So, uh, so anyway, so with that, um, we've got just a few minutes left. So I will turn to Arthur to uh, put forth whatever his uh, criticism is, um, let people respond for a few minutes, and then we'll need to wrap up because uh, this has been so juicy today. We've come to the end. So Arthur, what would you say? What uh, is your criticism? I, I was going to throw out th uh, uh, five challenging questions. Uh, quick okay, we don't have time for five. So if you pick the most challenging of okay. the five, we'll be able to take that. <laughs> all right. So, um, well, first of all, I love what uh, Savita said about adolescence and Donna mentioned the failure of, of, of democracy. Uh, all these values get corrupted. With every gov big government in the world failing, why on earth would we want an even bigger, more powerful one? Okay. Anybody want to tackle that or else then we can get to the second one if no one. All right. Well, let's let uh, Ron jump right in. Uh, I think that the problem is that with the absence of a world government, it accentuates the competition between the nations without any kind of rules. I think there's a huge difference between unlimited competition and limited competition. Limited competition seems to be a process that works very well to improve things. Unlimited authority in one person or one group is just not a good way to proceed. Okay. Well, and, and that quick next one is... Uh, well, hold, hold on. Anybody else want to speak to that? Or, and if not, we'll go right to the next one. Okay. Go ahead, Arthur. Okay. This is, this is uh, the lightning we've round. Seen how, we've seen how big corporations end up controlling our governments. Maybe this is one Bob can answer. Uh, isn't getting, creating a world government just going to give the corporations a bigger tool to manipulate and control all of us? Well, that's certainly a possibility, but it's not the only possibility. You know, you have to realize politics and economics are the two important things that need to be considered. Aristotle took the position, and I agree with him, that politics is more important than economics, that the political controls the economic, but you cannot avoid the, con the situation Economics does make a huge difference. Even in our democracy, it makes a huge difference who's got money and who's got not money, who's got time to participate. So the competition has to be limited, but I think you need to have some kind of competition. That is the way to move forward. So the problem is how to get limited competition. That's exactly what federation is all about. It's a middle way between just one united world government where everybody must do things one way and an anarchy where everybody just does whatever they want to do without any kind of restrictions. I think we need government to provide rules for limiting 
Good. Let me let, uh, I, I see David's hand first, then Donna, then I'll come in, then we'll have to begin to wrap up. Go ahead, David. I would respond to Arthur by saying the problem with globalization under the current system is that transnational corporations are unregulated because there's not that system of world law. And so what World Federation would do would be to come up with some kind of legal system in order to make sure that corporations would follow environmental uh, laws and protect the planet, protect uh, the common areas of the planet, and that's not being done under our current international system. Mm -hmm. Thank you, David. Donna. And I, I would add, and I would add that we could make sure uh, in the Constitution that uh, that corporations are not seen as people the way they are. That's that's a real problem. We got to fix that. Excellent point, Don. Yeah. And, and my, my addition. Question: Are we out of time? Uh, we, we're at, well. I, I'm 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 answering your question next. Yes, and then we'll be then we'll have to switch to closing. Um, so yeah, so when, when I'm asked this question um, in, in, you know, when I'm doing public speaking, uh, and maybe this is why you mentioned my name, because you may have seen me answer it. Um, but what, what I, I like to say is that, you know, once upon a time, you know, governments were here, and corporations were here. And, and for those of you who don't, uh, who are not on camera, who don't, who don't, you know, aren't seeing it, I have my, the, the, the government, hand, I have two hands up. Government is above the corporations. So it used to be that, that if a corporation would want to come into existence, they would knock on the door of the government, they would be issued a charter, and then they would operate. And as long as they were good actors, they were allowed to operate. And then when they turned bad, they would pull the plug. The, the government would come down, take away the charter. And there's even a name for that. It's called the corporate debt sentence. Uh, that they would get, and then they would die, okay? But now, as you know, the multinationals are here, and the governments are here. So the multinationals now could get, you know, childhood soldiers in that country, go pollute there. If they're kicked out, they pollute in the ocean here, you know, this and that and the other, and there's no one above them. So logically, there are two ways out of this dilemma. One is you put the genie back in the bottle, which you know what, ain't gonna happen. Or the other is you take we the people and put us here, you know, reestablish that order so that we, so that we, the people are once again above the corporations could once again regulate now the multinationals and, and they would have to apply to the world federal government for their corporate charter and they would be regulated that way and the delicate balance of the universe is once again restored. Thank you. Wonderful. So, um, so we do, we have about four, okay, I'll, I'll take Bharat's comment as the last, or Bharat's comment as the last. Oh, okay, then David, it's got to be quick. We've got four minutes and we want some time to close. So Bharat, you, you're on mute, T take it off mute and take it away and then David. You're still on mute. I just want to leave Good. with a with a thought. Uh, comes out of what Suveda said about the stages of development of our community. Uh, I'm thinking about the same kind of development that we require within ourselves, because in a sense, the transformation needs to come within for me to recognize that all the others are my brothers and sisters or fathers and children and mothers is comes because of the way I would think inside me of my relationships. So in some sense, I think we need to think in terms of the internal uh, development of a human being ourselves through our education, through our community, and as such, maybe build this, uh, overcome the barriers to you know, become one. And as I'm thinking about my father, talking about his community being a small village in a small state in Gujarat, and then from there, his awareness came of the, all the Gujaratis in Western India, and then all of a sudden independence and became part of India. 
and I go over here, come overseas, and well, I I've identify got two minutes. myself. I've got two minutes to wrap up everything. Please finish okay, your just thought. One, can I just say one? Yeah, please finish your final? thought. Okay. So all I'm really saying is that just as I expanded, maybe we'll need to expand an intermediate stage from instead of from all the nationalism to world federation, maybe we need to go regional federations and those regions could become eventually a world federation. Just Thank you. Thought. Thank you, David. You've got a minute. Yeah. Uh, well, these are issues that will maybe we could get to next time, I hope. Mm -hmm. uh, one is the question of the Bill of Rights of States. Because I have always learned that it's uh, individuals have rights and governments have powers. So I'd like to us to talk about that next time. Uh, why that? Because uh, there's a slippery slope of, of maybe government rights over individual rights. So I'm concerned about that. And the second part was another part of Ron's book where he talked about using economic sanctions. And uh, how do we deal with sanctions which really more dramatically impact people than the leaders who are doing the things that we really want to sanction. So I'd love to talk about those next time if we could. Great, thank you. Um, so let me, before I turn it over to Gail, first let me thank all of you uh, for your participation. The uh, 90 minutes flew by. And uh, I'd love um, after the fact, if anyone wants to email you know, comments or things about how this format work, we're, we're always trying to improve it. So we'd love to hear it. Um, let me just say that we have now defined about 20 specific volunteer jobs that we have if people want to get involved, but want to get involved in a very kind of small level. So we have things like helping on planning specific campaigns. We have archival work. We have writing specific parts for the new website. So if anybody's interested in, in getting involved who's not already, who wants to do a specific chunk on a volunteer project, please uh, on our website, the, the email is there, outreach at globalsolutions.org please send us a note and we'll get back to you. And the other thing I wanna mention is we are now in the midst of our spring fundraising drive. Uh, you may have gotten a snail mail envelope. Um, if so, we encourage you to, uh, to give. And if you haven't gotten that, you can still do that on the website. So I wanna thank you for that. We have a lot of plans in terms of expansion. And again, you know, printers don't print things for free. Um, et cetera, et cetera. We need money to do what we want to do. So with that, I'll turn it over to Gail to uh, say the final words for today. And can I make hey, an announcement at some point? Like I'm, I'm, I'm afraid we don't have time. Go ahead, Gail. I'd like to remind you again that our next session will be a month from today, the second Saturday of July, which is July 11, same time and same place, place being Zoom, and time being noon to 1.30 Eastern time, we'll discuss the last two chapters of Ron's book, chapters uh, seven and eight, and also chapter nine, which is not in his book because there wasn't room for it at the time it was published, but which Ron sent to us and which I will send to you again by PDF attachment so that we can discuss all three of those chapters. I wrote chapter nine because the translation of my book into Esperanto was being done and the English language was already almost 10 years old. So uh, Johanna Rapley wanted an update. And so that's why I did the chapter nine. So he could include it in the Esperanto translation. Okay, so I'll send you the, the book again, you know, by the whole book by, PDF attachment and also chapter nine separately because that wasn't in that and Ron, Ron sent it separately. Tom Hastings. It is, it is in the, the ninth chapters at the end of the PDF that we've been all been using. Oh, it is. Oh, oh, okay, great. So I just have to send the one, the one attachment. Okay, and then after um, next, next month, we'll probably take a month break to give us time to read the next book on our schedule, which is my Country is the World by Gary Davis. And um, yeah, I think David Gallup is holding it up there. And um, Arthur is also uh, very familiar with it. So that does it as far as um, my announcements. If there are any others, let us know. Oh, so you're opening for announcements. Okay, we're going over time. 
Go ahead. Okay. Very quick announcement is that David Gallup will be giving his wonderful slide presentation and talk at our uh, our new weekly Zoom conferences on Wednesday the 24th. It's uh, 1 p.m. 1 p.m. Eastern time, uh, and we can send out an announcement to invite you all to uh, to join in that and invite others to join it as well. Okay. So, thank well, you. thank you everybody for a really interesting, productive session. And well, we'll hey everybody. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful session. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks for doing it as a role player and making it fun. That's good. Yeah. Yep. Thanks, David.